insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow, where we take a deeper look into how the issues of today will impact the world of tomorrow, from politics and world news to media and technology. We discuss how today's headlines are becoming tomorrow's reality. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow. This is episode 12, the Cryptocurrency Conundrum. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my co-host, Sam Whalen, today. Hello, everybody. How you doing today, Sam? I'm doing okay. So today we're going to be talking about crypto. Do you own any crypto? I did for a little bit. I had Dogecoin when that was like a joke. Yeah, um, it still is, by the way. Yeah, but it's kind of settled out because I was using, I mean, we'll talk about it, but I was using Robinhood to get it. Yeah. And I think... My friends and I all started doing it as a joke. Um, but yeah, I had a little bit of Doge for a while. Not anymore, though. Okay. Doge actually is uh, not that difficult to generate. It's not like uh, your Bitcoin and stuff like that where it's uh, finite and crypto complicated. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how any of it works, though. That's the point of this show. You'll uh, explain it to all of us <laughs> in uh, great detail. <laughs> yes, I will, hopefully, in, in terms that we can all understand. Uh, but before we do that, I would... Uh, uh, suggest folks subscribe to the podcast itself so you get it first thing on uh, Monday morning at 8 o'clock when they come out. You can subscribe to the audio version of the podcast by looking us up as Insights into Tomorrow. The video versions of the podcast and all of our network podcasts are listed as Insights into Things. You can get us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, pretty much any place you can get a podcast these days. I would also invite folks to uh, give us your feedback email us at comments at insights into things.com. Let us know how we're doing on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can give us feedback on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. Shoot us a note on Instagram at insights into things, or you can reach out to us on our website at www.insights into things.com. So today what we're going to be doing is we're going to take a look at what cryptocurrency is. We'll understand a little, bit, a little bit about what blockchain technology is. Then we're going to take a look at some of the real-time or real-world impacts that cryptocurrency is having on today's economy and whether it's worth investing in. And then finally, we'll wrap up by looking at how cryptocurrency is changing the world and what the future of crypto looks like. And we'll talk a little bit about a new phenomenon in crypto called NFTs. So hopefully by the time we get done here, we'll all have a good understanding of what crypto is. And we'll be dumping money into the market to buy some. <laughs> Shall we get started? Yes. All right. So what is crypto? So this definition of crypto comes from NerdWallet. I figure that was kind of a safe place to go to. So cryptocurrency or crypto is a digital currency that can be used to buy goods and services, but uses an online ledger with a strong cryptography to secure online transactions. So when you, unlike a, 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 a nationalized currency, there's no borders to crypto at this point. It exists entirely online. And... It's basically tied up inside of a cryptographic algorithm. Much of the interest in these unregulated currencies is to trade for profit, with speculators at times driving prices skyward, as we've seen recently with uh, Bitcoin. Many companies have issued their own currencies, often called tokens, and these can be traded specifically for goods or services that company provides. Uh, everyone's familiar with microtransactions, and nowadays you can buy um, currency with a company that you then use to 
buy things inside that company. It's no different than when you used to go to the arcade and the arcade machines didn't take quarters. They took tokens. So you put a dollar bill in a machine and got four tokens out instead of four coins. And that kind of kept that money tied up inside of that, uh, that establishment. So cryptocurrencies also use technology called blockchain. So we'll talk about blockchain in a second. That's really the driving technology behind blockchain. But part of the appeal of cryptocurrency is the security of it. A lot of people feel the anonymity that uh, cryptocurrency offers is a selling point uh, because you can go out and make a transaction, a purchase online somewhere and not have that traced back to you through a PayPal account or a credit card or something else. But what people don't realize is it's not as untraceable as they think it is because there is a digital footprint. There's a digital trail that goes along with it that can be traced back to your wallet because you have to have a digital wallet that you apply these coins to. So with that in mind, questions, statements, inquiries? (laughs) No, I think think that that all makes sense. I mean, my familiarity with Bitcoin is mostly from – the last season of Mr. Robot, actually, which ended a while ago. Um, but in that show, the economy basically tanks. And this one company, um, <clears throat> E-Corp, comes up with E-Coin, which is basically takes the place of physical money. So everybody has their E-Coin wallet on their phone. So I kind of got the concept a little bit from that. I mean, it's a fictionalized portrayal, but they did their research in terms of you know, using Bitcoin as a replacement for physical money. Sure. And, and really, I mean, money is... Currency itself is anything that has a value associated with it that you can trade for things, whether it's paper money that we have, whether it's gold coins because the uh, material that it's made from has a value associated with it, or nowadays with U.S. currency where there isn't a, a backing to it, there's no silver or gold backing to it, there's an intrinsic value based on the current economic state. So as a result, the dollar goes up and down depending on what our trade state is and and other factors in the world. Cryptocurrency is the same sort of scenario, but it's affected by things very differently. Like one of the things that we're seeing nowadays is um, Bitcoin is soaring right now. And one of the reasons it, it took a recent jump was Tesla, Elon Musk's company, uh, decided that they're going to take Bitcoin payment for cars and they invested more than a billion dollars to acquire Bitcoin. Well, anytime uh, a commodity is purchased in volumes like that, the cost of it goes up just because of the perceived value of it at that point. So you have you have speculative investment like that that's causing uh, a rise in value. Yeah, that happened with uh we talked about Dogecoin earlier too. Elon Musk would like make a tweet about Dogecoin and it would shoot up like 20 cents or something like that. Sure, sure. So like and you get that with regular stocks too, but with crypto it's even more volatile like that. Well, and Elon Musk is a great person to pick on because he's the type of person who stock in Tesla goes up significantly and then he tweets and says, "Oh, well, that's over that's that's overvalued." And then the stock plummets. And you know, when you're the second richest man in the world, you can stand to lose $40 billion and it doesn't really put a dent in your bank account, but your other investors can't afford that kind of recklessness and that volatility in a stock that they're investing in. And, and we'll talk later about the investment angle of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, but we're going to find that's the same type of thing with, with crypto. So the technology that it is based on is blockchain. <clears throat> now, this information comes from another website, Investopedia.com. Blockchain is a decentralized technology spread across many computers that manages and records transactions. Blockchain is a specific type of database. It differs from a typical database in the way it stores information. Blockchain stored data in blocks that are then chained together. Blockchain. I guess. Blockchain. (laughs) 
Once a block is filled with data, it's chained onto the previous block, which makes the data chained together in a chronological order. So one of the problems that you have with this is that as you continue to mine coin in a blockchain, the blockchain gets larger and larger and larger, which requires more storage capacity, it requires more bandwidth to handle, it requires more computing power as, that, as it gets progressively larger. Different types of information can be stored on a blockchain, but the most common use so far has been as a ledger for these transactions. In Bitcoin's case, blockchain is used in a decentralized way so that no single person or group has control. Rather, all users collectively retain control. So when you're going to mine Bitcoin, you download whatever the current version of that blockchain is. The entire thing. And as you're churning through it and you fill up the block itself, you're sending that data back out to this collection of computers. So when we're talking about downloading it, is this like terabytes, pentabytes? I don't know how big does it get. Uh, I don't know what the last count was, but you're talking a massive amount of data right now. Like like it would take, I, th I think I was looking at numbers earlier, and it took eight hours or so over a gigabit line to download the current one. Um, once you have it, though, you get incremental updates yeah. to it. But that's just a sign of how large this is. And the larger it is, the more computations have to be done. <clears throat> so the problem a lot of people are running into is that in order to mine Bitcoin now, people are using very sophisticated hardware. In fact, NVIDIA just came out with their latest line of video cards and they cryptographically crippled them through a driver update so they couldn't be used for blockchain because what's happening is you're actually burning more energy in computational power and cooling to run these machines than you're generating in actual funds. Um, so it's environmentally... Environmentally... It's not a good thing. I mean, we're not drilling another hole in the ozone or anything, <laughs> but this is not going down the right path. Um, so in Bitcoin's case, the blockchain is used as a, as a way to store the, the ledger on here. And the decentralized blockchains are themselves immutable, which means that once the data is entered, it can't be changed. And for Bitcoin, this means that transactions are permanently recorded and viewable to anyone. And that's where that lack of anonymity comes from. Because in order for this whole system to work, you have to use a shared database for these transactions. Now, your existence in here is probably some, you know, 64 character long random GUID number, not you know, Sam. So there's that level of anonymity, but it also records origins of these. So it can tell geographically by your IP address where it's coming from. So when you process something on the blockchain, it knows what your ID is, it might not know who you are, but it can see where you're at. So a lot of cyber forensic analysis is going into some of these because a lot of people and the criminal underworld are using Bitcoin to fund their terrorist organizations and criminal organizations because of that level of security. So as a result, federal authorities and, and government authorities around the world are developing new tools to try to de-anonymize some of these transactions to, to track it down so that they can, they can generate evidence against criminals. So that's really what blockchain is. It's the technology behind, it's the database behind cryptocurrency. Questions, comments? No, I mean, it seems relatively straightforward so far. Um, yeah, so how do, my only thing is like, how does this translate into actual value? Because like, I, I understand how you get it and how it's made, but like, is it just because it's, there's so much of it that it gives it value? It's, it's not that there's so much, it's that there's so little. Um, so for instance, if you look at Bitcoin, the way that you you compute the 
um, or the way that you mine Bitcoin computationally, there's a finite number of Bitcoins that are out there. And the more that are found, the fewer that can be found. So it's almost like, think of it like a baseball card. You know, 10 Ricky Henderson rookies are made. That's all that will ever be made. And they're all in packages that are sitting in stores. So when the first one gets purchased, it's worth, say, $1,000. But when the second one gets purchased, you know that there's only eight more out there. So the value of the ones that are found go up until all 10 are found. And then there's a fixed value because they exist. They're the only ones that are going to exist. So that's why you have Tesla getting a bunch of it. Exactly. And it skyrockets. The problem that you run into is as people trade it and buy and sell and, and companies start to adopt it as a actual currency, it gets more precious because you have a finite pool of resources now that are now being traded mm -hmm. in large blocks. So people fight over it. and then Exactly. Get, yeah. Then you have, organi you have governments. Like, for instance, Russia has outlawed Bitcoin. So you can't use Bitcoin in Russia to do anything. Where in the United States, I could spend Bitcoin to buy a pizza. You know, it's, it's literally that simple. And in the early days of Bitcoin, it was used very frivolously. It was generated a lot on colleges because a lot of college students would use uh, computers on campus because of the computational power to generate these. So you'd have students that would have 10 Bitcoins that would generate overnight. Then they'd want to order pizza. Well, they didn't have any cash, so the local pizzeria would accept Bitcoin. So you'd spend two Bitcoin to buy a pizza. And one Bitcoin now is worth like $10,000 or something like that. Right. So you have people that <clears throat> spent over $20,000 on pizzas when they yeah. were in college. So that's why the volatility of it kind of makes for opportunities, but it also makes for misuse of the currency as yeah. well. So we're going to take a quick break uh, and we'll come back and we'll talk about what the impact of cryptocurrency is on today's society. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Today on Insights Into Tomorrow, I find the button on the board to actually hit the right <laughs> scene. <laughs> Today we're talking about cryptocurrency, and we're going to talk a little bit about the impact of cryptocurrency on today's economy. So we've talked about Bitcoin. We've talked about Dogecoin a little bit. There's actually more than 6,700 different cryptocurrencies that are traded publicly today. And this is according, according to CoinMarketCap.com. Cryptocurrencies continue to proliferate. Raising money through initial coin offerings. You've heard of IPOs, initial public offerings for stocks. ICOs are what crypto coins actually use to generate their funds. The total value of, of all cryptocurrencies as of February 18th, 2021 was more than $1.6 trillion, according to CoinMarketCap. And the total value of all Bitcoins, the most popular digital currency, was pegged at about $969 billion. Now, you can't have that much market cap and not have a huge influence over the economy. I mean, I, I can't, it's hard for me to imagine another 
segment of the economy other than like Apple that's a trillion dollar company that has that kind of influence over it. Um, so just that, that value alone gives you a footprint and a, and a place at the table that countries, I mean, that's, that's more value than most countries in the world actually have as far as value goes. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, that's an astounding amount of wealth <laughs> and yeah. like going back to the pizza analogy from earlier, like to think that it's come from that, you know, using it to get a, a pizza to $969 billion in what, 20 years. Yeah. Not uh, even that. Yeah, yeah. Less than that. Um, it's just interesting and, and stocks in general or the market, how that works, it all kind of mystifies me. It seems like it's gambling with extra steps and like, um, how things get value. And, and in this case, how things can skyrocket in value over time. It, uh, it fascinates me, but it's not something I <laughs> have an idea how to get involved in. Well, and that's one of the things, that's one of the real distinguishing factors between a cryptocurrency and a stock. A stock is a piece of something. It's a piece of a company. And its value is based on the value of that company, its revenue, its, its profit, and how that company is being run. And all that information, when you're a publicly traded company, is publicly available. So if you want to go do the research on Intel and see how much Intel is worth, you can see what their assets are, what their liabilities are, what their profits are what contracts they've landed over the last 12 months. You can do all that research and find all that information. And, and largely that's what, you know, analysts and stockbrokers do for you. They, they do all that work for you and come back and say, okay, buy Intel because they're worth it. <clears throat> but you have the freedom to go get that information yourself and do it. You lack that information for the most part when it comes to crypto. I mean, crypto isn't – representative of anything substantial it's literally data that's being passed around and a lot of people have a very difficult time wrapping their heads around that it's hard to understand why you would need something like that granted you you can have a currency that doesn't have borders so for instance you know you have the euro Versus the dollar. And the euro traditionally trends a few cents higher in value than the dollar does, depending on what's going on from a political, geopolitical standpoint. But that currency itself is based on gross domestic product. It's based on manufacturing output. It, there's a measurable metric that you can look at for it. So you can kind of predict, okay, well, you know, we know that everyone's being hit by the pandemic right now. And Europe, sections of Europe are being hit worse than others. So the chances are their, their uh, economy is going to be impacted by that further. So maybe now is not a good time. And I'm saying this strictly from a theoretical standpoint. I am not an investment broker or am I qualified to comment on any of this stuff? But you can see these signs, these trends, and determine that that might not be the investment that you want because the euro may go down as their economy is impacted. You can't do that with Bitcoin. Tomorrow, Bitcoin could lose 30% for no apparent reason. Or it could gain 30%. For equally no reason. It's volatile. That is, that is <laughs> the, incredibly, the buzzword, yeah. incredibly volatile. So why do people like cryptocurrency? Why don't you, why don't you tell us, you know, why people, uh, what, what the appeal of cryptocurrency is? Yeah. So supporters see cryptocurrency, uh, things like Bitcoin as a currency of the future. Uh, and they're racing to buy them now before they become more valuable, which we've already seen that with going from buying pizzas to being worth, you know, 900 some billion dollars. Uh, some supporters like the fact that crypto removes central banks uh, from managing the money supply, since over time, these banks tend to reduce the value of money through inflation. So Bitcoin can't be inflated the way you, uh, normal money can. Other supporters like the technology behind crypto, uh, like the blockchain, which we talked about earlier, uh, because it's decentralized processing and recording system and can be more secure uh, than usual payment options. 
And then finally, some speculators like crypto because they're going up in value and have no interest in the currency's long-term acceptance as a way to move money. And that's a very good point, is that if you look at it from a long-term standpoint, it's so volatile and traded so frequently that people aren't looking at it as a long-term. Like people buy Disney stock and they hold on the Disney stock for 30 years <clears throat> and they continue to, to improve, increase in value. They may get dividends from it. But ultimately, it's a long-term thing that someday you'll sell that and it's an investment. Whereas cryptocurrency is almost like day trading. Yeah. I'm buying it this morning because I know this afternoon, chances are it's going to be 30% higher and I'm going to make a fortune That's off That's essentially what I was doing. Me and my friends, when I talked about Dogecoin, oh, that's what we would do. We bought it and then for like a week straight, we would check every day to see what the value was. And if and you could set in the app we were using, you could set, um, I think it was called a limit order. So like if, if Dogecoin went up to... 80 cents, you can have it sell then. Right. So like if we thought like, you know, Elon Musk was going to tweet about it and it would make it go up in value, which happened. A lot of people made a lot of money when Dogecoin, like when that phenomenon was happening. Sure. It's kind of stabled out now, but like it was like day trading and, and, you know, Robinhood, I know got a lot of flack for that because so much money was being dumped in that they couldn't keep up with it. And yeah. I think those, that finding came out a couple of days ago where the way Robinhood works is they, when you go into uh, and for those that don't know, Robinhood is an app where you can, you know, trade stocks and trade crypto. Um, they, when you go to buy something through them, they actually wait and basically give you an IOU so that if they can get a better value for it, they can then take that and then you also get the stock. They take the off the top. Right. <laughs> but when the things with Dogecoin was happening, so many people were buying in. And with GameStop as well, the GameStop stock situation, they didn't have enough money to keep up. <laughs> so it's like, you know, when, when the trend hits the whole world and everybody's doing it like day trading, it can cripple something like Robinhood that's just, you know, the app to the middle sure. man almost. Yeah, their 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 business model was not capable of keeping no. up with that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but one of the other things about crypto that we talk about here is that it it doesn't use a centralized bank which mean it means it can't be influenced by governments or government regulation. So you look at how some of the economy works in the United States, and you've got the Federal Trade Commission that makes sure that there's no insider training and, and that uh, things are done on the up and up. You have uh, the Federal Reserve that sets interest rates. So with a traditional economy, you have a lot of outside influence. It's not just the market value. Um, a lot of it is the government trying to control the money. Part of that's inflation. You know, when the economy is bad, the government puts more currency into circulation, which devalues the currency but increases spending. And with a cryptocurrency, they don't have that control, which is one of the reasons why Russia had banned Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin could really come in and take over an economy because the government has no control over it. So a lot of governments don't understand crypto yet. And those that do and have kind of a good understanding of it are kind of afraid of it. And with good reason. Yeah. One of the other things that we talk about here is the encryption associated with it. Well, that encryption allows you to hide transactions. So right now we've got a big push in, in the United States where the federal government wants to have access to encrypted data on your phone, in your email, through your social media, uh, because they claim that without that, then they can't do their job from a law enforcement perspective. So the federal government wants access to your encrypted information on your phone. So if they get a warrant for a search warrant, they can execute it where they can't do that now. Well, they'll never be able to do that with cryptocurrency. They can't go to a manufacturer like Apple or Google and say, put a back door in or we're going to put you out of business. There's no central authority for Bitcoin. So they, they can't exercise that control. And as a result, it's very appealing to a lot of people who want to do international transactions. You know, when we do transactions with a company overseas, there's a conversion rate that happens. And that conversion makes money for someone. Some money broker somewhere skims off the top, like you talked about with Robinhood. <clears throat> 
With Bitcoin, it's traded at face value. Nobody skims off the top. Nobody makes a profit off of it. And generally, when no one's making a profit off of a transaction, people have a problem with it. Yeah. <laughs> so you can't have that man in the middle who's doing things. Um, but again, cryptocurrencies are speculative. There's no, there's nothing tangible about a cryptocurrency that says, okay, well, I see that Tesla put out uh, 20% more cars this year than they had forecast, so their value is going to go up. There's nothing like that with crypto. It's literally just made up as it goes along. And that's something that scares off investors. So what you get is a completely different class of investors that go after cryptocurrencies. Um, as an investor myself, I'm very risk averse. You know, I will invest money in an 8%, a guaranteed 8% return any day over the possibility of a 15% return with a 50% chance of loss. That's just the way I am. I'll always go for the sure thing. I mean, like I've been investing a little bit. Like I don't, as you've just, have I've made clear by this show, I don't really understand how a lot of this stuff works. So I've been using Robinhood and, and they got into trouble for kind of gamifying it. But I like that personally because it makes it a lot easier to understand. Um, <clears throat> and the way I've been treating it is it's, it is like gambling where you, if you're putting money in, like you have to be okay to lose it if you mess something up or like you're, you're okay having it sit there for a long time. Cause you know, a lot of stocks are like you talked about with the Disney example, a long term thing. So it's, I don't, I haven't been doing it enough to understand my, like how I do it. Um, but at least with the crypto stuff, I was doing it daily trying to get like, just the smallest amount of value out of it um, where it's, it's not, it's not a set 8%, you know, a guaranteed 8% return like you were talking about. So it's, it is weird seeing the comparison of, you know, play it safe, long term, long term, but with crypto, it's play it now <laughs> and yeah. hope for the best. Absolutely. So the, I guess the real overriding question is, are cryptocurrencies a good investment? So like we said, cryptocurrencies may go up in value, but many investors see them as more speculation than not real investments. And the reason for that is that just like real currencies, cryptocurrencies generate no cash flow. So for you to profit, someone has to pay more for the currency than you did, which is called the greater fool principle. Yeah, I love that one. That's a funny name. <laughs> uh, and it's a legitimate theory for, for investing. Um, but if you contrast that to a well-managed business, which increases its value over time by growing the profitability and cash flow of an operation, ex experts note that cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin may not be that safe. And some notable voices in the investment community have advised would-be investors to steer clear of them. Because it's gambling. Yeah, it's I mean, just you, gambling. You hit the nail point. on the head. You're probably better off going to Vegas yeah. and betting you know, $5,000 on black at the roulette, then you aren't putting it in to cryptocurrency. Of a particular note, uh, Warren Buffett compared Bitcoin to paper checks saying, quote, it's, it's a very effective way of transmitting money and you can do it anonymously and all that. A check is a way of transmitting money too. Are checks worth a lot of money just because they can transmit money? And I think that really boils it down because in order to, do anything with Bitcoin, you either have to generate them through very complex, very costly uh, computational uh, efforts, or you need to buy them. So if you invest the money to buy them, you've paid somebody money for money. Really. Yeah. It, and you're paying that conversion rate. Mm -hmm. If you generate it, then you're paying the money to actually, it's not free. Like a lot of people think that, and that's, that's part of the problem is that people think that, oh, well, cryptocurrency, I can generate that. Can, I can quote unquote mine that on my computer. Well, I already own the computer, so it's costing me nothing. If I can mine three Bitcoin, that's a fortune. Well, you're not mining for nothing. You're paying the electric bill. You're paying to cool it because it's, it generates so much heat to, to do these computations. People have actually turned mining uh, computers into heaters for their homes. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, what they've done is they built a computer with five or six uh, graphic processor units, high-grade graphics processor units, 
and they channel that heat into their house, and that's how they heat their house. That's insane. I saw I saw one person who lived out in Colorado or something like that, and he actually funneled the heat from his cryptocurrency computer to a chicken coop, and that heats the chicken coop outside. Well, there you go. <laughs> but that's no different than because you're still paying yeah. to to use that power. One of the latest trends now is they're putting a lot of crypto mining farms in Alaska so they don't have to pay for the cooling costs. So they're just pulling – Put them in the ice. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're pulling outdoor air in and that's cooling these machines off. Yeah, I know there was – this was a while ago, probably like a year ago, but the N Nintendo Switch had a thing, the gaming console, where uh, people couldn't figure out why when they played this one game, it was like some cooking game, why their Switches kept overheating. And it was because they were using it to mine Bitcoin in the background for the game. So people's switches would overheat and turn off, and they couldn't figure out why. Because it's not like, you know, the switch is like that big. It's not like it's a, you know, a PS5 or something. Yeah. So people were like, what's going on here? And they looked into it, and it was they were mining Bitcoin in the background when you played the game. It was insane. Yeah. Yeah, it's scary. It really is. Yeah. For those who uh, see cryptocurrency, uh, such as Bitcoin, as the currency of the future, it should be noted that a currency needs stability so that merchants and consumers can determine what a fair price for goods is. So let's take the instance of Tesla. So they're going to be selling a car, and they're going to price the cost in Bitcoin out to what the equivalent dollar value would be. So let's say, for instance, you buy a, a Tesla for $80,000. Let's say that's... For the sake of easy math, that's eight Bitcoin, all right? Say so Bitcoin's at $10,000 each. Well, if Bitcoin drops in value at any point in time while you're still paying for that car, then you just got, like if it drops to 5000 per Bitcoin, you just paid half price for that car. What merchant is going to deal with a currency that's that volatile and that prone to have them lose money it, like it just for for tesla to to go that route i think puzzled a lot of people do you think that it's going to end up becoming regulated if enough businesses get involved do you think it's just going to sidestep the government and they're just going to regulate it themselves especially if they have the majority of it like a tesla or another big corporation well and uh, that's that's actually a very interesting proposition you can't regulate it you can't because of its decentralized nature. So even if you own the majority of it, like owning the majority of a company, you control that company. If you own the majority of Bitcoin, you can't dictate the price of Bitcoin because Bitcoin is only worth what the market will bear. So if Tesla owned 60% of the available Bitcoin out there, they could ask whatever they want. But if nobody wants to pay that value, then it's not worth that, right? Like think of selling on eBay. Oh, you know, I can put my Star Wars figures up on eBay and ask $5,000 for them. Doesn't mean they're worth 5000 if nobody's going to buy them. <clears throat> and that's what you're looking at with Bitcoin is that you, you can't derig it. So I don't know why at this point in time someone like Elon Musk would get into it. If for no other reason than just for publicity. I'm pretty sure he had an SEC filing the other day where they have to call him like Crypto King now or something yeah, like that. Yeah, <laughs> I saw that. Which one of my friends, it was half joking, but he was like, well, that's so they don't have to say he's a CEO. So when he does dumb stuff like this, he can say, well, I'm not CEO, I'm the Crypto King. Right, <laughs> it's different. right. <laughs> but I, I don't know. I, I, he does <clears throat> things like, I mean, this is the man who sold flamethrowers to to promote his boring company, his, yep. you know, his mining company. So we could do a whole show on him if we wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> He's I, like I, Tony Stark, but not <laughs> as cool. <laughs> but as we said, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies have been anything but stable through much of their history. For example, while Bitcoin traded close to $20,000 in December 2017, by 2020, it was trading at record levels. Uh, I'm sorry. It uh, dropped as low as 3200 later that year. Well, that's that's 70% of your value. That's ridiculous <laughs> to, to have a drop like that. And then by 2020, it was back at record levels again. So the price volatility creates a conundrum, hence the title to the show. Hey, uh, See, you made fun of me for the title. I did make Greg. It was funny. <laughs> 
if Bitcoins might be worth a lot more in the future, people are less likely to spend and circulate them today. So I'm going to stop buying pizzas with my Bitcoin. I'm going to hold on to them, (laughs) making them less viable as a currency. So think of it almost like a commodity, like gold. So gold rarely drops in, in value. And what happens is a lot of people buy gold and they hold on to it because it's a good investment because it doesn't drop in value. Nobody deals in gold as a currency anymore. It's not practical to deal in it. But because it's stable, people are going to hold on to that and use that to back other ventures. Because this is volatile and could drop or increase dramatically, people don't want to spend that because they don't want to spend $20,000 on a pizza. Even though it may only be twenty dollars today, to you know, a year from now it could be twenty thousand dollars. So it doesn't lend itself to being used to transmit money. And finally, they say, why spend a bitcoin when it would be worth three times that value next year? And that's exactly what they're saying. It's more an investment gimmick, I think, than it is a, a real currency. So then, do you think it will go? By the wayside eventually, if once if people adopt this line of thinking that it's it's you know not worth the effort to spend it, I think Bitcoin has a very limited lifetime to it. I think cryptocurrency in general does. I think blockchain has other practical applications that can be used for more realistic things. Uh, I think what we're seeing right now with crypto is probably a fad because it's just too unstable. Yeah. You know, people. Investors don't like instability, um, so you're going to find that it's going to it's, it's going to probably lose its widespread adoption pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. But let's take a quick break, and we'll come back, and we'll look at what we do think of what the future of uh, cryptocurrency is and how it's changing the world. <laughs> Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights Into Tomorrow. We're talking cryptocurrency. And as we said earlier, uh, cryptocurrency is not new. It's been around since roughly 2009 when Bitcoin was first created. Uh, But in recent years, it started to have a more significant impact on the world. Cryptocurrency has done this by changing the way various industries operate and opening up new opportunities for individuals and businesses alike. The creation of cryptocurrency also introduced blockchain technology to the world, which is, I think, the most significant contribution that we get from crypto. According to Statista, revenues from the technology are expected to reach more than $39 billion U.S. dollars by 2025. From these figures, it's clear the cryptocurrencies and the technology that surround them are having a major impact. Here are some of the examples of how cryptocurrency is changing the world. Why don't you tell us about these? Sure. Uh, so alternative international financial transactions, which we kind of talked about earlier with it being a borderless currency. Uh, businesses are always keen to find a way to complete international transactions in the most secure way possible. So cryptocurrency-based solutions like Ripple can help with this. Ripple operates on an open source platform and it enables the seamless transfer of both cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Litecoin and fiat money like USD and yen. I don't know what fiat money is. Fiat money is is national currency. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that was a term for it. Uh, and then finally, the main process of Ripple is payment, settlement, and remittance that is similar to the traditional SWIFT system, which is used by financial institutions. 
What is the SWIFT system also? Well, SWIFT system, we're not going to go into today. Okay. That's a lot more complicated. Okay. Yeah. We'll get an economist next time to break that down for yes. us. Yes. Uh, second, more options for secure online payments. Cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology can make it easier for people to make online payments. Blockchain wallets store private and public keys that enable payments to be made securely and quickly. Also, many sites in various industries accept cryptocurrencies as a safe way for people to send and deposit money. So, for example, online gambling sites that accept cryptocurrencies are popular among young adults and in general with players due to the added security that is provided. The worldwide online payment system PayPal has also recently announced that it is going to start allowing customers to buy, sell, and hold cryptocurrencies uh, in its online wallets. PayPal was Elon Musk, right? He invented that? I believe that's where he started. That. So, yes. yeah, another Elon, he's back. <laughs> another uh, mention of him. Uh, revolutionizing supply chains. So Bitcoin, the global economy, is reliant on secure and efficient supply chains. This makes supply chain security a major concern. The blockchain technology that enables the use of crypto can also be used to improve the security of supply chains thanks to its transparency and decentralized nature. Certain currencies like Walton Chain and VeChain or VeChain are specifically aimed at improving the safety and speed of supply chain operation. Providing a platform for creatives, it can often be difficult for professionals like musicians to sell content without interference from middlemen like producers. So they can use crypto like XRP uh, to allow them to sell content directly to consumers. This is because consumers can access the content and pay for it using a real-world payment solution. That's an interesting note. I never thought of that, of, of, of how it can be used to actually help uh, people that might be, you know, yeah. uh, scammed by a producer or something like that. Changing the way NGOs deal with money. Non-governmental organizations, NGOs, engage with crypto as a way of getting currency to underprivileged areas of the world. During the current crisis, the Red Cross in Italy has also started accepting Bitcoin donations from people in order to boost its fund and help it provide the support that people need. Uh, so using it uh, for more humanitarian efforts. Sure. And, and the other thing we kind of have to make note of here is that we talk a lot about Bitcoin because that's in the, in the news a lot. And Bitcoin's a form of crypto but it's obviously not the only version crypto in general can be used for other different things depending on how it's generated like for instance we talked how bitcoin has a finite number of bitcoins that you can ever get out of the blockchain but other currencies like dogecoin it's unlimited so you can continue to generate dogecoin which is why the value never really soars because there's an infinite amount of it out there but it's also a legitimate form of, of currency because it is digitally signed through a very strong encryption. So something like that, you can easily use that to do electronic transactions back and forth online or to transfer large sums of money or, you know, things like that where you want to have secure borderless uh, transactions. That's not to say that Bitcoin's the best crypto for that. But crypto can be used for these things. It, it does away with that decentralized bank. It does away with these conversions. It does away with the regulations that you get bogged down in. One example, which is probably not a good example, is North Korea. Okay, So North Korea is under all kinds of sanctions. They can't trade, you know, tea at this point in time without having some kind of sanction slapped on them. But they can trade crypto mm. because it's unregulated. Yeah. There's no way to stop that. I didn't even think of that. <laughs> now, that's a bad example of that. But the good example of that is if you're in a oppressive third world regime that you're trying to fight for the freedom of the people there and the government is oppressing you. You can fund those operations through cryptocurrencies and still manage to get the funds that you need. Yeah, it sort of cuts out the, the red tape and the middleman and all that to just get them the currency where it needs to be. Exactly. I, I think personally moving forward, cryptocurrencies themselves are going to be more of a medium than they are an asset or an investment. Uh, they're going to be used for transactions. Like a lot of trans business transactions use uh, EFT fund transactions now, and you get a lot of hands touching that type of stuff through the banking industries. And I think cryptocurrencies eliminate a lot of that stuff. So I, I think the future, there's a future for cryptocurrencies. 
I think it's very different than what we see today. I think we're going to see them take on a different role. I think we're going to see them be used by different people for different reasons. I don't think they're going to be a viable investment anytime in the, in the near future just because of the volatility. But one of the things that we are seeing crypto use for, and again, this is, this is a different use of blockchain, is something called an NFT or a non-fungible token. And these are a type of cryptocurrency created on smart contract platforms such as Ethereum. And they're unique digital objects that can be cool to own or even profitable to trade. Like it's a World of Warcraft or something? <laughs> similar to that. Not, I mean, you joke, really? but it's similar yeah. to that. But for instance, Elon Musk's girlfriend was just in the news because she put up $8 million in artwork as NFTs. Uh, the NBA is involved in this. You can purchase a, a non an NFT, a non-fungible token of an NBA highlight, and you own that highlight. Like the footage? No, just oh. the rights to the highlight. Okay. This is where it gets confusing. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of lost. Think of it as, let's go back to the analogy of baseball cards. All right, so as a kid... I would buy baseball cards. You'd go out to the store, you'd buy a pack of them, you'd open them up and you'd see what card you got. And if you got a rookie card of somebody that you knew was good, you held on to it and it had value. I could take that to a trading card store somewhere and sell it. This is sort of the same type of thing, but you never get the card. <clears throat> so for instance, you pay for an NFT and that NFT happens to be for... I, I say Ricky Henderson because that's the only valuable baseball card I ever owned. <laughs> so you pay for a token, a digital token for Ricky Henderson's rookie card. And that card stays in the store in the window and everyone can come by and they can look at that and, and they can gawk at it and they can ooh and on everything, but nobody can have it. They can just see it. You own it. Now you can, trade it to someone else you can sell it to someone else you can sell that right to it but you never actually own it that sounds lame why would you want to do that <laughs> especially if it's like grimes artwork wouldn't you want to hang artwork like in your house you just have a thing that says you own the artwork you don't own the art well and that's like you can have copies of it but you own the right to that item itself. So no one else can own the right to it. It seems like a pyramid scheme or something. <laughs> and that's how it's been described. You own by the a lot idea of, of our <laughs> That's how it's been described. So so what is fungible and non-fungible? You're asking me. Yes. Oh uh, well, conveniently enough, we have a very well produced <laughs> show notes. Cryptocurrencies can be fungible, meaning all the currencies unit, i.e. tokens, are the same and equal, like grains of rice or dollars. Non-fungible tokens are the opposite. Every cryptocurrency unit or token is unique and cannot be replicated. This quote non-fungible property can be used for many things, even certain types of currencies. But the current NFT craze is mostly fueled by digital art and collectibles, kind of like we talked about. Uh, people have figured out that a unique digital object can be interesting, cool, and even have a significant monetary value. It's why the space has recently blossomed, encompassing thousands of projects involving artworks, gaming, and sports. So... How do NFTs work? So it really depends on the platform, right? So given the vast majority of NFTs that are created and traded on Ethereum, let's focus on that. So NFTs created on Ethereum's blockchain, which is immutable, meaning it can't be altered like we've talked about all blockchains. Mm -hmm. No one can undo your ownership of an NFT or recreate the same one. They're also quote, permissionless. So anyone can create, buy, or sell an NFT without asking for permission. So if you are an artist, you can create your own NFT. You don't have to license it through someone else. So how does that work with like the NBA? So the NBA creates their NFTs oh, for okay. these highlights. Okay. And they're the only ones that can create their NFTs. Right. Gotcha. They're the authority for it. And if every NFT is unique and can be viewed by anyone, just like that card in the window, anyone can walk by the window. So again, it's like a, a, you know, the analogy I gave you with having a card that's forever available for people to use. I don't know why people would do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, people are doing it. There's a huge budding industry, which is why I threw it in at the end of the notes here because it kind of was an afterthought in, in my research and doing this. 
But I wanted to put it in here as another example of how blockchain itself is being used without it being technically a cryptocurrency. Um, and, and I guess, you know, let's take a step back and talk about um, where we think it's going to go. So we're going to take a quick break. Our last break, we'll come back and we'll talk about what the future of cryptocurrency is going to look like. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Investopedia.com says that the economic analysts predict a big change in crypto is forthcoming as institutional money enters the market. There's the possibility of crypto uh, will be floated on the NASDAQ, which would further add credibility to blockchain and its uses as an alternative to conventional currencies. Some predict that all crypto needs to be a verified exchange traded fund, an ETF. An ETF would definitely make it easier for people to invest in Bitcoin, but there still needs to be the demand to want to invest in crypto, which might not automatically be generated with a fund. What do you think? Where do you think we're going to go with crypto based on the discussion that we had here? What do you think its future is? Um, well, I didn't know a whole lot about it going in, and I've definitely learned a lot today. Um, so I said I'd probably agree with a lot of what you're saying is that it seems like it's – the blockchain element of it seems like it's useful and can be used for lots of other things. Um, but breaking it down in terms of the actual reasons to invest in it and there not really being that many and the volatility of it too, I think unless there's a change in that and how that works, which I don't know how you do that, it seems like you know the the best thing we're getting out of this is the blockchain technology. Right. Yeah, and Investopedia looks specifically at at the outlook for Bitcoin, and they say the future outlook for Bitcoin is the is you know it's subject to much debate, which we kind of agreed on here. While the financial media is proliferated by so called crypto evangelists, Harvard University professor and econom of economics and public policy Kenneth Rogoff suggests the quote overwhelming sentiment among crypto advocates is that the total market capitalization of cryptocurrencies could explode over the next five years, rising to $5 to $10 trillion, which is, you know, astronomical. The historic volatility of the asset class is uh, no reason to panic, he says. Still, he tempered his optimism with that of the crypto evangelist's view of Bitcoin as digital gold, calling it Quote, nutty. Yeah, that's the official economist term. <laughs> that is the official term, yeah, uh, stating its long-term value is more likely to be $100 than $100,000. Rogoff argues that unlike physical gold, Bitcoin's use is limited to transactions, which makes it more vulnerable to, the bubble -like, to a bubble-like collapse. Additionally, the cryptocurrency's energy-intensive verification process is vastly less efficient in systems that rely on a trusted central authority like a central bank. And I think that's that's really a great place to make that distinction is that the value or the the viability of a bitcoin is in its computational authority whereas the value of a traditional currency or stock is in its institutional authority. 
and being decentralized with no institutional authority, you have to rely on that encryption to to know what the value is and to know that it's a legitimate transaction. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, it makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, even this guy that we just quoted, he he starts off with uh, towards the more optimistic side saying, you know, it could be trillions of dollars in the next couple of years. But then once he thinks about it, it seems like he tempers it being like, well, it's also very volatile. And, you know, he, he say the word bubble and that kind of got me thinking of like, maybe, maybe this is a bubble. Maybe it will, maybe it has the chance to collapse. And especially with it being like, uh, so nebulous too, that it might even lend itself further to a collapse. Like, uh, you know, dot com and things like that back in, what was it, the nineties, right? When that happened? Late nineties, yeah. Yeah. So maybe, I mean, I hope that doesn't happen because it seems like it's, you know, it's, it's interesting technology. I hope that it doesn't completely collapse. And if it does collapse, maybe it can come back in some way. Um, but yeah, it just seems like overall it's better to just be safe than sorry. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, we both agree that there's probably a lot more scrutiny to yeah. be, to be paid to this. Bitcoin's main benefits of decentralization, uh, and transaction anonymity have also made it a favorite currency for a host of illegal activities, including money laundering, drug peddling, smuggling, and weapons procurement. This has attracted the attention of powerful regulatory and other government agencies, such as the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, the SEC, and even the FBI and Department of Homeland Security. In March of 2013, when this was an infant state here, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network issued rules that defined virtual currency exchanges and administrators as money service businesses, bringing them within the jurisdiction of government regulation. In May of that year, the Department of Homeland Security froze an account of Mt. Gox, the largest Bitcoin exchange at the time, that was held at Wells Fargo, alleging that it broke anti-money laundering laws. Um, New York's Department of Financial Services issued a, uh, subpoenas to 22 emerging payment companies, many of which handled Bitcoin, asking about their measures to prevent money laundering and ensure consumer protection. Um, so these are very real cases out there that the government fearing what you can do with this cryptocurrency, and, and they're fearing it under the guise of illegal activity. Um, which is legitimate, but their fear goes a lot deeper than just illegal activity. Um, their fear goes to a lack of control, a lack of regulation. I mean, the federal government does not like things it can't regulate. Yeah, and it seems like they're, they're most likely going to use the crime angle to get their foot in the door, right, for increased regulation. And they were doing the same exact thing with encryption on your personal phones. And and even the encryption on your phones, they're taking it even a step further and they're they're hammering home this whole idea of uh, child pornography and child exploitation. And that's why, you know, let's do it for the children. Think of the children, yeah. Right. And that's that's really what they're hammering home to try to, to crack your encryption. But we're looking at the same type of thing here. So I think unregulated currencies like Bitcoin that are speculative and have a potential for high value are – much more likely to come under the scrutiny of the government than a transactional thing like Dogecoin where people are using it for legitimate things and it doesn't it doesn't have enough power behind it to really warrant being used for illegal activity. But again, in the end, I think it's really the technology that comes out of this that's going to be the, the winner overall. Uh, I think cryptocurrencies, they're, I don't think they're going to go away anytime soon, but they're not changing the economy anytime soon. Governments just aren't going to allow it. Yeah. That's, I mean, it seems like it would be that simple, right? They could just say no. <laughs> yeah. So what are you, what are your final thoughts on cryptocurrency? Um, well, I definitely learned a lot about it today. That was kind of nice. Um, and I hope that our viewers learned something too, if they were as clueless as I was. Um, but yeah, I mean, it seems like that that's, it's not as <clears throat> future proof as you know, some of the jokes about it might make it seem like, um, but you know, blockchain seems like it could be used for a lot of really good things and hopefully good things. Um, and I'm curious to see where governments take it in the next five to 10 years. If we do end up getting, you know, that trillion dollar level that that economist was talking about, how governments are going to respond to that and, and how they're going to take it seriously or, you know, try to outlaw it or ban it and, you know, around the world and, and how that's going to affect it. 
um, all that is interesting to me. Um, so yeah, it's just a matter of, you know, see where it goes. Yeah. And I agree. I think, I think a wait and see attitude is probably the best. Uh, I think we should not let Elon Musk, you know, people of Elon Musk's nature lead the charge on this. Um, I mean, between selling flamethrowers and launching his sportster into space for, for political, for, uh, media gimmicks and stuff like that. Uh, I don't really think he's the authority that we want to use, uh, in this case here. I think it's, it's probably best to, if you're interested in investing in it, I would suggest you do so very cautiously. Uh, I would not liquidate your 401k and dump it into Bitcoin. That's for sure. Um, but you know, it's speculative. Uh, there's a chance that you could make some money off of it today. Why not get in on it like everyone else does if you do it smartly? So, but that's all we had today. Did you have anything else you wanted to discuss? No, I think we did it. All right. I think that is it. Uh, before we go, I would ask folks once again to subscribe to the podcast. Audio versions can be found as Insights into Tomorrow. Video versions as Insights into Things. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, and any place you get your podcast feeds from. I would also ask you to give us your feedback. Let us know how we're doing. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can get us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We stream six days a week on Twitch when I don't have technical difficulties like this week. On Twitch, we are at twitch.tv slash insights into things. Uh, if you have a Amazon Prime membership, you do get a free Twitch Prime monthly. We would love it if you sent that our way. Helps us to uh, keep the lights on around here. And we have a lot of really bright, hot lights around here we have to keep on. Uh, we don't use it to mine Bitcoin. I promise you that. Um, you can get us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. We're on Instagram at insights into things. Or you can get us on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. And that's it. We're done. Another one in the books.